sorry that was a little loud, uh, but uh, I think we got it now. Are you all awake now? <laughs> Hi, my name is Greg Niemeyer. I am a professor at Media Innovation at UC Berkeley, and I'm here to introduce our speaker today, uh, Marty Hurst, who's going to speak about new ideas. Uh, before we do that, um, I wanted to uh, mention a couple things about the course. And um, I wanted to thank uh, Letters and Sciences for supporting this lecture series, and also at the amazing Berkeley Art Museum, and uh, Taylor, who's uh, welcoming us, and Dave, who are welcoming us here, um, and making this beautiful video production possible. So our students right now are working on uh, new ideas, and uh, we're uh, having this project to come up with an, a matrix of new ideas, where we try to tease out the good ideas and the bad ideas, and see some merit in the good ideas as, as well as the bad ideas and the crazy ideas and, uh, and leverage the freedom to think into many different directions and then get these directions to converge onto something more uh, useful. So uh, our guest speaker today, as I mentioned, is Marty Hurst. Uh, uh, following uh, the uh, amazing talk we had um, last week and uh, preceding the talk by uh, Elisa Giardina Papa, which is uh, going to be about new forms of labor. And um, I, it turns out that Marty Hurst and, um, is somebody I was potentially able to meet many, many years ago um, when we both were spending time at Xerox Park. And Xerox Park is a wonderful research institution that's uh, funded by, was at the time funded by Xerox. And uh, Xerox, of course, is the corporation that uh, patented and uh, distributed the uh, xerography invention. And xerography um, simply means to write with dry materials and uh, so with powder instead of with liquids. And uh, we talked about the term chirography earlier, which means to write with your hand. So xerography is the exact opposite because the inventor who, uh, um, who made this uh, technology possible uh, was tired of writing things by hand and typing things because he had arthritis. And so he was looking for a way to um, write without using his hands. And that's where xerography came from. And uh, this is uh, re relevant because this inventor was actually working at the patent office, which is a place where our speaker today, Marty Hurst, had a, a considerable impact in re reviewing um, the policies of the patent office and proposing new policies that led to new forms of uh, patenting software. Um, but um, so Marty Hurst is a professor of information science at UC Berkeley and uh, is creative by making inventions. And uh, uh, Marty got their, uh, her BS, MS, and PhD, all three from UC Berkeley, so clearly it worked. And uh, uh, is today an ACM fellow since 2013 and a, a member of the uh, Computer Human Interaction Academy since 2017. Um, uh, Marty invented a lot of things that have become kind of daily practice today uh, when we interface with computers. And uh, one of them that was really striking to me was sentiment analysis. Sentiment analysis is a tool which allows a machine to look at a text and figure out if the sentiment of the writer was positive or negative. And um, this requires a deep sense of uh, understanding of both linguistics and computer science, which is uh, the two fields that uh, Marty was able to combine. And she also invented an algorithm that become, became known as Hearst Patterns. And it's always really cool when you have a, an algorithm that's named after you, so congratulations. It applies lexicosyntactic patterns to recognize hyponymy, which means the sort of the order of words in terms of how they relate to, to each other hierarchically. And uh, so, for example, animal and uh, uh, penguin uh, relate to each other in a particular way that, that all uh, penguins are animals, but not all animals are penguins. And so for a computer to understand that without actually knowing language and the world we live in is uh, not that easy, but um, that is the, one of the things that that algorithm is doing. Um, so uh, let's see, uh, one, one book that, um, that Marty wrote was about uh, search user interfaces. In fact, the first book about search user interfaces was written in 2009, and uh, we now know that, that search defines so much of our thinking and search algorithms and bias in search algorithms and the way search, uh, search inter interfaces are designed. All that affects really the way we understand the world, and so the search we have today sort of makes makes us uh, change our world views all the time. And uh, so it's a really important topic, and it's a topic that Marty was aware of um, being significant uh, very early on. So um, Hearst has received the NSF Career Award, an IBM Faculty Award, and a Okawa Foundation Fellowship. Her work on user 
interfaces has had a profound impact on the industry, earning her two Google Research Awards and four Excellence in Teaching Awards. So please join me in welcoming Professor Marty Hurst. Well, thank you, Greg, and it's a pleasure to be here today. And uh, I will say I, I won't claim that I invented a lot of the things that Greg said I did, but I appreciate the sentiment. The little, uh, uh, he's a very kind uh, fan and a very great colleague, and it's wonderful to be a part of anything that he does. I'm a huge admirer of his art and his teaching. So let me uh, get started here. So Greg gave me a big challenge, which is to talk about creativity. It's not something that I usually lecture on, and but it is something I think about a lot. And the way I think about what I do in the creativity side, a large part of it is inventing things, as, as he mentioned. So I wanted to talk about what goes into making inventions. Greg's also urged people in this lecture series to be personal in our description, so to talk about what do we ourselves do as opposed to the field as a whole, but I couldn't resist looking in the literature and trying to see if I could verify my ideas of how I create and how my colleagues create are substantiated in the literature. So I did do a fair amount of literature review and I found that actually a lot of what I do is pretty typical, at least for creativity in science and engineering. But I want to start you off with an impression, something that, that I find inspiring that I find very creative, that is not, sorry, not something that I personally have done. Oh, I'm having a lot of fun here. And that is this. a game called Nog, and I find it really inspiring in terms of creativity. Not only are the graphics beautiful and kind of mind-bending, but when you actually do this game, there's no words anywhere in the game, there's no instructions. You, some of you might know it. You actually just open it up and you have to start doing things, manipulating these devices to figure out how to open them up. And it's, uh, it has interactions that I've never seen before. And I found myself using this game as a source of inspiration when trying to design user interfaces for more prosaic pursuits. For example, to come up with new ways to teach programming. And this is an example uh, that I wanna use throughout of using ideas from a completely different area to inspire what you're working on, making connections from across disciplines to inspire the work you're doing, which is a large part of how I work and how I'm creative and how many people are creative. I'm also going to use images from this design uh, for my slides. So. so this is the outline of my talk. Uh, so as I said, Greg asked us to make this personal, so I'll very briefly summarize where I'm coming from, what my background is, how I got to where I am. Then I'll talk about creativity as a process, creative strategies, and then applying this to examples from my research, as Greg has asked me to do. So. Um, I'm Marty, I was born in California, and I actually went to Cal as an undergraduate. I then worked for HP for a year after my undergraduate, decided, okay, I definitely do wanna go to grad school and get my PhD. So then I was in the computer science department, which was used to be in Evans Hall. Graduated right before they moved to the new building. Then I worked at Xerox Park uh, as a research, actually I worked at Xerox Park while I was a graduate student, it was very inspiring as an intern. Uh, responsible for a lot of my ideas. It was a magical place bringing together artists as well as computer scientists, as well as social scientists to 
invent technology, and it was really uh, foundational and fundamental to my development. And in fact, when I was a computer science student, there was no human-computer interaction in the UC Berkeley computer science department, so I learned about it from Xerox PARC. And then after I graduated with my PhD, I was a researcher there for many years, and then I came back to Cal as a professor in the School of Information and the Computer Science Division again. All right, so how did I get there, though? Well, when I went to college, I was one of those people who did not know what they wanted to do. I was interested in a lot of different things. I was an undecided major. I was interested in language. I was interested in books and literature and writing and reading. I was interested in the brain and psychology, and I was interested in biology. I wasn't very good in the lab, however, kind of a fumble fingers, and I didn't really like blood. So it wasn't really clear what I should major in. Well, it turned out, though, I did hear about this thing, and we're talking early 80s, called artificial intelligence. And I was like, well, that's kind of intriguing, because that takes my interest to sort of psychology and, and language, because I can think about trying to make a computer talk. And that seems really neat. And so I didn't major in any of these. I decided to major in computer science, even though in those days, computer science wasn't really a very well-known topic. And to program, you had to do a card punch and stand in, in line in a basement with a stack of these punched cards to then give your cards to an operator to run them through a computer. And if there were any errors, you had to do it all over again. So it was a pretty unglamorous and very somewhat physically taxing major back then. And I don't really know what possessed me, but I just decided I was going to do this. And I did it. Uh, and uh, the rest is sort of history. But I will tell you at that time, it, you know, AI it was going through a period kind of like now, where it was everybody was very excited about it, but it wasn't really paying off. Uh, and then it kind of became unpopular. And, uh, but I guess now it's a lot more successful than it was then. But I was in it because I was just like, maybe you could make a computer intelligent. What does that mean? That's very intriguing. And that's what drew me into it. But all of the work I've done since then has really been a combination of these things. I've done work with biology. I've done work with language and computers, with biology computers, with how people think and computers, because that's what human-computer interaction is about, is trying to understand how people think and make computers more usable based on that. All right, so let's talk about the process of creativity. So this is actually uh, from a theory put forward in 1926 by someone named Wallace, but it's been borne out uh, by research since then and also by pretty much anyone you interview who does creative work in sciences and technology. That there's four main, you could, he had five originally, but it kind of got boiled down to four main parts of the process. Preparation, incubation, elimination, and verification. So what are these? So preparation is you think about the problem and you think about it a lot and you think about it in all directions and you gather lots of ideas and resources, you read stuff, you think from different fields or you work with a bunch of different people and you, different people bring different perspectives and you do a lot of planning and attention and you consciously make connections and, and think about the constraints of the problem. Then, oh, and uh, if people think, you know, a flash comes out of nowhere, Many people have noted that serendipity rewards the prepared. In other words, although it's common, this eureka moment people claim comes out of nowhere like a bolt of lightning, anyone who does creative work who gets that experience knows that it only comes after having had a large, a long period of preparation. So that's uh, the incubation period. So this is also really important. The incubation period is the unconscious part. This is the part where you, after having done the preparation, you go off and you don't think about the problem. You take a walk, some people like a walk, some people sleep on it, uh, some people like to take a shower or a bath, play with your dog, whatever it is, is you don't think about the problem consciously. So, oops, oh sorry, that last line is wrong. I shouldn't have that includes planning and attention. It should just be, leave results unfinished while turning to other problems or just generally relaxing, either working on something else or not working at all. And over and over, scientists, creative people, doing creative work say, this is really key. So when I'm working on a hard problem, I work on it over many days, weeks, or months. I think about it, and then I go away and don't think about it. And that includes preparing talks. It's 
really important. First pass isn't good. So if you have an assignment <laughs> that requires some creative thought, you don't want to do it the day before it's due. You really have to start it early and, as we say, marinate on it. <laughs> let it let it marinate in your mind and then come back to it multiple times. Here's Alexander Graham Bell in 1901 saying, I am a believer in unconscious cerebration. The brain is working all the time, though we do not know it. At night, it follows up what we think in the daytime. When I have worked a long time on one thing, I make it a point to bring all the facts regarding it together before I retire. And I have often been surprised at the results. Have you not noticed that often what was dark and perplexing to you the night before is found to be perfectly solved the next morning? And I certainly find this happens all the time. As long as I prepare beforehand, and then I, for me, it's the shower, I focus in the shower, and I solve all the problems. Or not all, but a lot. Then there's illumination. The flash of insight or click into place that cannot be willed or consciously controlled. It's the culmination of a successful train of association, probably preceded by many unsuccessful trains. So this illumination, uh, it doesn't always happen, but that, that flash, that lightning strike, it does, it can and does happen in the right circumstance. I personally have experienced it numerous times when I am working very hard on something, then go away, come back, repeat, Sometimes, not that often, but sometimes it all comes together and it does feel like a lightning strike. And that is a super awesome feeling. But you can't force it. You have to do the preparation and the incubation. And I'll talk more about strategies to get to that point. Here's Henri Poincaré, and I'm kind of quoting these people because they're actually on record saying these things. Most striking at first is the appearance of a sudden illumination, a manifest sign of long unconscious prior work. Often when one works at a hard question, nothing good is accomplished in the first attack. Then one takes a rest, longer or shorter, and sits down anew to the work. During the first half hour, as before, nothing is found, and then all of a sudden the decisive idea presents itself to the mind. So that's the thing. They're emphasizing you have to have worked on it before. And then the final step is the hard work, the verification. Even if you have that flash of insight, then you have to do the hard work of consciously and deliberately working through it, validating it, fleshing it out, and making it real. So those are the main steps, and of course, they are, it's not just one stream, one linear stream, but it's iterative often. All right, so those are the overall steps, but what are some strategies for making these things happen? All right, so at least for inventing, I'm going to list some of the ones that I use and that, again, are reflected in the literature. And usually for any given project, uh, there is some combination of these, but maybe not all of them. So the first and most important probably is the motivation. And motivation can take different forms, at least for my work. So sometimes the motivation is I really want to solve a problem. There's something really bugging me and I really want to solve it. That isn't enough. If it's not the right time to solve a problem, if, if the technology isn't there, the situation's not right, then you might, you're just not going to succeed. But sometimes the time is right. Sometimes the motivation is, you know, you really want to bring something into being. There's just an idea you have and you want to make it happen. You have a vague idea and you, or a clear one, and you want to make it real. And that is the motivation. That can be a very strong motivation, at least for me. And another one is there's a question you have that's just intriguing you and you want to answer it. So at least for me, these are the three main sources of motivation for tackling something and, and for inspiring creativity. Then a strategy, a key strategy I'll talk about a lot, I've already mentioned, is using associative thinking, which is making links between things, making connections between disparate things. And studies show that people are more creative if they link disparate categories, different quite categories from different domains. Then this unfocus the mind, you know, walk in the moods, woods, take a shower or sleep on it. That's an important part of the process. Another strategy that you don't always have to do but can be good for some is look where others are not. So work on unpopular problems. Some people like to be very competitive and work on the latest problem and compete with everyone and do the most you know, advanced idea. 
Other people like to look at unexplored areas and break new ground. That's more my style a lot of the time. Then bring a fresh perspective. This is related to making connections, but this is, has to do with being cross-disciplinary or you yourself don't have to be if you make a cross-disciplinary team. So crossing one field to another allows for new ideas or viewing ideas with a fresh eyes. So if someone goes, say, from chemistry to molecular biology, they often bring a new perspective on a problem and see things differently. Uh, or, or people in a new, who cross from one area to another haven't yet assimilated what everyone has decided isn't possible. And this also happens with new people coming into a field. So uh, one of my colleagues went and did something in, our, in one of my fields, and I remember her remarking on how she hadn't been told by all of us older people that it wasn't possible, and so she went ahead and made great progress on it. And that, that was a great lesson for me. Impose constraints on the solution. So constraints limit choice, and without them, people move to obvious solutions, which often are, you know, if they were obvious, then somebody would have already solved it that way, so it's probably not a good idea. So uh, research shows that constraints encourage creativity. Just like if you're, I don't know about you, but if I'm parallel parking, if I have a really big spot, I don't do as good a job as if I have a narrower spot. If I have less room for the parallel parking, I do it more precisely. And finally, be patient and work at it. Sometimes it takes a long time before you're going to find the solution. Sometimes you need to give it up, and there is a tension about you know, figuring out when should you stop. A good example here, though, is uh, nanocomputing. So one of my colleagues has been working on nanocomputing, or uh, actually quantum computing. Nanocomputing is also a good example, but one of my colleagues in the computer science division has been working on nanocomputing since I was a graduate student, so really since the late 80s, early 90s. And he's been working on quantum computing. It seemed like it was going nowhere, it was just crazy. And really, it just wasn't going anywhere. It didn't seem like they were getting anywhere. And now, quantum computing, it's, it's on the threshold of being something that can be used. 30 years. So, so you sometimes just have to be quite dogged and keep working and make small and incre incremental advances. Some people don't have the patience for that. But even if you're working on uh, something less long-term, you still have to keep working at it in order to find solutions. They don't always appear immediately. All right, so let's talk about the importance of making connections. And here I have a Steve, Quag's joke, Steve Jobs quote, creativity is just connecting things. I think it's not just that, but I think it's an important part of it. And here's a 1957 document. There's a lot of work on creativity in science that comes from the turn of the century or, well, the previous century, I guess or even in the 50s. So this is a nice quote. Successful scientists have often been people with wide interests. Their originality may have derived from their diverse knowledge. Originality often consists in linking up ideas whose connection was not previously suspected. Therefore, reading ought not to be confined to the problem under investigation, nor even to one's own field of science, nor indeed to science alone. And this is really true. Really creative breakthroughs are often across different areas. A good example is Stephen Jay Gould. I don't know if any of you know him, but for a while he was a very popular author who wrote a lot of books. Here are some of them. Uh, Mishmeasure of Man, A Wonderful Life, Pandasum, just really popular books ever since Darwin, popularizing a lot about natural science. And he wrote, my talent is making connections. How do the parts of the snail shell interact? What are the rates of growth? Can you see a pattern? I could sit down on just about any subject and think of about 20 things that relate to it and they're not hokey connections. They're real connections that you could forge into essays or scientific papers. And so he was able to really bring these topics to life and make new connections. Not everyone works this way, but it can be a great way to be creative. And there are games around this. How many of you have played Code Names? You guys know this game? If not, it's a really fun game. The goal is you, you have a bunch of cards with words on them, like, like shown here, and as, as shown in this image, you have to try to make clues that combine the words together. So in this example, find three cards that relate to the clue music. So that might be, that's the clue that the player has to come up with. They have to look at all of the words and then make a 
statement about another word that links all of these together. At the same time, you have to be sure that, that the words that belong to the other player do not get invoked. So it's a really good game to practice making connections with. And the more cards you connect, can connect with your word without implying the other cards, the better. So the, uh, you see that this is the second game that I've brought up. Games can be a really great source of ideas and inspiration for creativity. People are very creative who make games. And if you analyze them and what's, what's their underlying structure, they can often transfer to ideas for your own work. There's some other ideas about making connections. This is again from the 70s. Uh, this notion of homospatial processing, actively conceiving and using two or more discrete entities in the same mental space, conception leading to the articulation of new identities. Uh, so uh, this is often used in advertising, but uh, this image just appeared in this week's New York Times Magazine, which is uh, Viktor Orban, the head of Hungary, Hungary and it was about, uh, the article was about how he is inspiring uh, people on the right to, uh, uh, he, he kind of has inflammatory politics and how, you know, so it's kind of an interesting combination. Something that people do in computer science is make tools to help people in the arts or generally people who want to be creative do this kind of thing. So there's a piece of work by uh, my colleagues at Stanford called VisiBlends that actually tries to help people make this kind of combination. So they, for example, will bring up an image like the sun and the Starbucks logo and suggest how they might be combined. So there are something that you can do as a computer scientist that's pretty fun, is try to make tools to make other people creative by using theoretical models of creativity. Another idea from the same researcher at Rothenberg is Janusian processing, named after Janus, the two-headed god, which, uh, which the idea is actively conceiving and using multiple opposite or antithetical thoughts or constructions simultaneously. He talked about Einstein in this example, about apparently he, he thought of somebody simultaneously falling and not having gravity. I, don't, I still don't really understand that. But as the idea is thinking of opposites simultaneously and coming up with a new invention from that. The same thing with uh, sort of the Heisenberg principle of wave and particle being the same phenomenon. I thought of a, an example that's inspired me, which is Lakoff and Johnson's work on metaphors, where, and this is very influential in the, in the field of cognitive linguistics and cognitive science, where they noted that metaphors pervasive in everyday life, not just in language, but in thought and action. Our ordinary conceptual system is fundamentally metaphorical in nature. So this was a kind of an earth shattering thought. We think of metaphor as being metaphorical and they were arguing that actually how we think about everyday concrete things in our lives is actually metaphorical. So this is in my view, an example of Janusian thinking where you take something that is physical and metaphorical and you say that they are the same. And I think this is probably why this work had such a huge impact. Also, it, it, it does seem to work when we talk about language. We say, life is a journey. That that's a metaphor that we use. It's a physical thing, but we, we overlay that on how we think more metaphorically or more abstractly. When you say, you could say someone is off track. They're spinning their wheels. We can make all sorts of elaborations inferences from starting with this metaphor when we talk about things going on in people's lives. Even, they even note how prepositions have kind of a metaphorical structure. So up or down or in or out, we sort of feel if something's inside or out and the metaphorical language that follows that. So I think this is an example of Janusian thinking. They also talk about how this idea can be used to help with poetry help poets. And so some students and I actually worked on a software tool to help poets be creative, inspired by this theory. Here the idea is to, to take uh, two words that can be combined, like the orb and the sun, the orb of an eye and the sun is an orb, so that might be combined in poetry.
can we combine pairs of words with a third word to inspire people to use more poetic language? So in this case, we start with a concrete word like storm and a more poetic word like surrendering and suggest a third word via word embeddings that might be useful for expressing things poetically. And so to test this, we showed sentences to people like this, barrage connects storm and surrendering how. And we found that people would then come up with poetic language or poetic ideas when we did this. So someone wrote, barrage connects storm and surrendering because a storm is a barrage of bad weather like winds and rain and people surrender when they feel a barrage of overwhelming things coming at them. So by juxtaposing these in a, in a motivated way, we think this might allow people to be, to have ideas about how they might link them in say a poem. All right, so returning now to our strategies for creativity and inventing, one of the points I made was uh, look where others are not. So an example I like of this is Jennifer Doudna, our, uh, one of our faculty colleagues here at Berkeley. This is a quote from a recent biography written about her by Walter Isaacson. She wasn't invited into the mainly male club of people sequencing DNA for the Human Genome Project, so she approached her work as if she were playing soccer. She says that when she plays soccer, she plays the positions that others don't play. In this case, she decided to focus on RNA with two accomplished women. So going where everybody isn't playing uh, ended up working out really well for her because I think as a lot of you know, she won the Nobel Prize last year along with Emmanuel Charpentier for their work on CRISPR. And, and of course, I think you all know that mRNA has become extremely important <laughs> for fighting nasty viruses, although that's not used in the current uh, vaccinations, but it's very promising for future work. And I'll talk more about that uh, in my work as well. Uh, another suggestion is to bring a fresh perspective. Crossing from one field to another allows for new ideas. So I want to use an example. Um, this is the, the post-it note, the story of the humble post-it note. Where did the post-it note come from? You're too young to remember when they didn't exist. But, but this is a story of Spencer Silver and Art Fry of the 3M Corporation. So Silver had invented this not-too-sticky adhesive. Uh, this was, of course, by accident, like a lot of these things are. He was actually trying to make a super strong adhesive for airplane parts, but he made this not very sticky one. He thought it was a great idea, so he, he thought there must be some use for it, but he didn't know what. And 3M was a big company, so he, he promoted it internally for years without success. He went around 3M giving talks saying, hey, this is, I have this cool thing. We should make a product with it. But he got nowhere, but people called him Mr. Persistent, apparently in the New York Times. Meanwhile, Art Fry worked at 3M and he was looking to develop new products. He heard about Silver's material on a company golf course, so back then they had like, corporate golf courses and people played on them, and he heard about it, so then he went and heard him talk. At first, he couldn't think of anything, any application, but then he uh, went to choir practice and he noticed his bookmarks kept slipping. And he thought, oh, hmm. So he had a bookmark made with the adhesive and tried it in his book, but he was still, he tested it with some people. He still wasn't sure it was gonna work until he got a bookmark, put a note on it to his boss, stuck it on a piece of paper and sent it through, I think through the corporate mail to his boss. And then he got it back with the, the bookmark moved and written on the other side or on the bottom saying, good idea. So Eureka, uh, product is born. This is an example of patience and persistence. So this is somebody where they, he had an invention. He really thought this ought to be good for something, but he just couldn't figure out what. And there was no notion of post-it note. It just, just did not exist. And it, this is partly the preparation as well. So if you're not thinking about something, you're not going to find it. But once you start thinking about it, you start to see it. It's kind of like if you, you buy a, a car, a certain car brand, then you see that that brand of car all over the place, or maybe you think you want to get a dog and then you start to notice dogs everywhere. Once you start to think about the thing, it starts, you start noticing opportunities. You start to see the gaps that you didn't see before. That's a really important part of this sort of invention is, you know, you've got this sticky material. What can you use it for? What can you use it for? What can you use it for? It's like what you're thinking constantly. 
And then you stumble upon it eventually. But it takes a long time. All right, so Greg gave me an assignment for this talk. He gave me a lot of assignments, actually. <laughs> One of them was to <clears throat> talk about how do you sort out good versus bad ideas. And, you know, of course, you never really know. You might toss out an idea and think it's bad, and it turned out it was brilliant and you missed it. So that, that's always a danger, but I have a few thoughts on this. Well, first of all, uh, we have to hear from Scott Adams of Dilbert fame says, creativity is allowing yourself to make mistakes. Art is knowing which ones to keep. <laughs> so basically, uh, not that helpful, but it's interesting that, that he thinks that it's, it's an art. It's also the case that you, know, you have to make a lot of stuff, and only some of it is the stuff you want to keep. So you shouldn't be afraid to generate a lot of ideas or a lot of art or a lot of whatever. You just keep the good ones. Even artists have some art that's masterpieces and other ones that aren't, and I think they usually don't know which one's going to be the masterpiece beforehand. <clears throat> so one strategy is to use constraints. I mentioned constraints are an important part for, of strategy for inventing, to encourage good ideas. And here, actually, I looked into the literature, and someone did a recent study, which was a meta-analysis, looking at 117 other studies, and they found that constraints are good. When there are no constraints on the search space, decision makers are prone to select the most intuitive solution rather than trying to identify novel ones, a process referred to as following the path of least resistance. Introducing output constraints may alter the conditions under which solutions are generated and in turn spark unconventional thinking and exploration of novel ideas. So constraining, like the parking place, making it a little smaller can cause you to have better results. Now, there are kinds of constraints that are harmful. So administrative constraints, a bad boss, people looking over your shoulder all the time, those sorts of constraints are not helpful for creativity. It needs to be constraints on the thing you're actually trying to produce, or your inputs or your outputs. Uh, other kinds of constraints can be harmful. So here's an example I show of, uh, in my field of what I think are bad ideas. And not only that, it's the same bad idea that appears over and over and over again. It's when you have a large set of documents, you try to summarize it by placing it in a two-dimensional space with little dots and a few words. And this is just a few old ones. People rediscover this idea all the time and always do it. And yet, it's uh, you know if it was a good idea, I think uh, we'd be using it all the time right now. So this is an example of an unsuccessful idea, and I think it's unsuccessful because people aren't using the right constraints. So why do we see them so often? Well, they're easy. It's easy to do, it's easy to compute, and no one has solved the hard problem of making a spatial layout of, of content that makes sense. Why are they a bad idea? In my view, and in the, as far, what the studies show, they do not meet the usability constraints. The usability constraint is my top constraint. Is this usable? If people come to use it, do they understand it? Do they continue to use it? Do they opt to use it given a choice of something else? And they fail in that constraint. But a lot of times people that are generating things with computers are not concerned about the usability constraint or they're just doing it off the side or just uh, that's just not a, um, something they can, they're concerned about. In my area, Making usability your number one constraint is very challenging, uh, but also is what leads to uh, most of the success. Another idea for distinguishing good from just okay is um, once you have ideas that are part of the way there, people often just want to stop and be done. And sometimes you have to because you have deadlines and that can be unavoidable. But you can often tell the difference if you are experienced, not if you're starting out, but if you're experienced, between something that's just sort of okay and something that nails it. And if you don't have that nails it, it all clicks into place feeling about what you're doing, you should probably keep pushing. Now, when you have co-authors and people you work with and so on, you often, um, people want to get a product out. And sometimes you just have to compromise. But there really is a difference. and. So this isn't really good versus bad, but good versus okay. And when you have had success, you can tell the difference between good and okay. 
but you need to go through okay to get to good a lot of the time. So there's nothing wrong with okay, just keep pushing. All right, so now we want examples from my research. And uh, it's not just my research in, in science and technology. We have lots and lots of collaborators. We work with colleagues and graduate students. So one strategy I said is don't do what everyone else is doing. And as Greg alluded to, uh, early on and when I was a grad student, I worked on user, I worked on search. Uh, not so much search algorithms, but user interfaces for search. And this was called information retrieval. It wasn't called search really then. There weren't web search engines because there wasn't the web. When I was a grad student, the web didn't exist. And it was actually very hard to get text to even process. But I was interested in it. I was just interested in this, how do you find information and show it to people. And I got interested in it very early and did very early work on search interfaces. And that ended up working out well for me because hardly anybody cared about it. And I was at Xerox Park where I learned about user interfaces. So I was able to bring two areas together where people weren't doing that, which also worked out very well for me. Another strategy is be motivated by something. And I, have long, I was long motivated by a problem where I wanted to bring something into being and I didn't like how something was. So what I didn't like were card catalogs. And here I have a picture of an old card catalog. And I managed to dig up a picture of what I think is the library from my elementary school, although it's got a lot of adults in it because that's what they have a photo of. And it's, got, it's painted a different color than it used to be. But I still recall when I was an elementary school student hating the card catalog, thinking it didn't make sense. It bothered me then. It bothered me whole, my whole life. I wanted to solve the card catalog. What didn't I like? Every, you could only get to the book one way. It was in alphabetical order. It didn't make any sense to me. You should be able to get to it from multiple directions with multiple subjects. And my whole life I wanted to solve that, although I didn't realize that's why I was making the choices I was making when I went to, made, chose my major. And I don't think I, I saw that line or whatever. But once I did and once I was where I was, I realized I could solve this. But I couldn't solve it right away because the web had to be up here and it had to become more mature. The thing I wanted to do didn't work when the web first started because the web wasn't dynamic. So often you want to invent something, but the, uh, the, the ecology isn't there yet. Sometimes things are ahead of their time. You can think about the uh, invention of the mouse and keyboard for, for the computer. And now we have gesture-based interfaces. And you might, be, you might think, wow, it's great someone thought about gesture-based interfaces. I wonder why they didn't think about that at the start. Well, actually, the people did think about gesture-based interfaces. We just didn't have the technology to invent them. So the mouse and keyboard were the uh, intermediate step because that's what we could do. Before. And of course, that was hard to get to. Uh, the bitmap display was hard to get to uh, uh, before we could even get to gestures. So sometimes things aren't ready for their full uh, inst uh, instantiation. So now I'll show a video of what we did end up doing, which is this dynamic faceted navigation. So let's see if we get this going. So first I'll demonstrate what we did with Nobel Prize winners, since that's timely, a timely topic. So we have just, uh, this is our research system on, this is old data, so we don't have enough women <laughs> winning Nobel Prizes. But what we can do is select all the Nobel Prize winners who won in economics. And we can slice and dice by different, different categories at will. So now I can actually narrow down by winners in California, and then it's grouped by Berkeley, San Diego, Santa Barbara, Stanford. These are, I guess, their affiliations. And we can see that Berkeley has the most, yay Berkeley. And then we can zoom in on one Nobel Prize winner. This is George Akerlof, whose uh, wife is now more famous than him because she's the Treasury Secretary. And we can see some other winners. And come back to the results. We can expand it. We can sort different ways. We can see, uh, say we just narrow it to who won in the 2000s, remove the economics constraint, see everybody who won at Berkeley in the 2000s, and now we have someone from the medical area showing up there. And we can continue and just see, OK, across all the years who won from Berkeley. This idea has then been transferred to library catalogs. So. My dream really was to fix the library catalog. We see it actually adopted eventually by Amazon here. And this is in their book search where I searched on fiction, 
or selected fiction. And then we can narrow that down if we want to by different categories like world literature. Here it is though in the, the library catalog for a university, for all the universities. So this is WorldCat. I can search on information retrieval. There we have the categories. We can slice and dice in different ways. So I think here we can see how many are published each year and what types, biography, fiction, so on. And then we can zoom in information retrieval in the law. So it's exactly the kind of thing I wanted to be able to do. Now we can see those books. So not only do we make it happen, but it eventually got adopted by the world. And that's the kind of thing you can do if you're an inventor. Another strategy is, is to bring together disparate fields. So my PhD student, Melody Ivory, obviously she's graduated now long ago, but she was working in an area called systems performance analysis and computer science and wanted to do something different. I was doing human computer interaction. So we just said, okay, what can we do if we combine our two fields? And we did, and we did something entirely new, which became a, a very successful research project with many, many citations. Uh, this was a performance, uh, this was a way to automatically assess the uh, pr performance or the usability of websites. So we brought this together and she automated that and uh, very successful work. Another strategy, as I said, use constraints and be patient and make associations with games. Let's put it all together. All right, so this is a piece of work I did uh, where again, something was bothering me and using constraints, which is usability and combined with games. So I have to give a little background first. Oh, well, this is done with a bunch of collaborators, including some undergraduates at Berkeley. All right, so first of all, what is this about? This is an ad for a class. Can you tell what it's about? Pretty hard to tell, all right? It's pretty hard to tell. So I ask you a question. In the realm of language and text analysis, how often do we have the designs we want versus those that our algorithms can easily make? So I argue that word clouds are there because they're easy to make, also because they're engaging. But they are not informative, and all the studies show, at least the studies that have been done, which uh, not that aren't that many, but we have now also shown it in our good way that I'm going to talk about, that people can't make sense of them, they can't find the gist, and if the size of the words is supposed to show the importance, people don't get that out of them either. What about this? Does anyone know? It's a summary. It's, it's a word cloud for the to be or not to be soliloquy using a standard word cloud software. But it drops the to be or not to be words, and you see things about sleeps and sleep and bear. The words are taken out of context. So it's not a good representation of that. So why are they used? They're easy to make, they're visually engaging, and they're commonly used. And surveys back this up. This is despite the fact that they're misleading in terms of the numerical values, and they don't summarize information well. Why does this matter? Well, if you're just using them for fun, it really doesn't matter. But they're being used a lot in scientific communication and in uh, journalism. So I think that matters. We're getting more concerned with misleading information, with disinformation. I personally think word clouds are a form of disinformation. If we look here where uh, somebody showed accepted papers in two conferences and they're trying to show how they changed from one year to another. Are there any alternatives? Well, yes, we can use a visualization like this, which shows the difference uh, and actually shows that actually all of these values were higher in one year versus the other because uh, almost all of them, simply because uh, there were more papers in one year versus the other. But it can also show the relative count much more uh, effectively. But it's not as engaging. So there is a key thing about word clouds, which is they're engaging. So we set out to say, OK, is there a way to keep the engagingness of word clouds, show the words, but make them make more sense? That was the alternative. So our goal was retain the engaging aspect of word clouds while imparting some useful semantic information. And our hypothesis was that organizing the words both semantically and visually will improve the understanding while retaining engagement. So here is what we did. If you start with sort of a typical word cloud, convert it like this. Organize the words into categories where they are semantically related, and then arrange them in a way that is uh, engaging. So the question is, the problem is, 
you have to have these groups be semantically related, and the existing algorithms don't do a good job of grouping words semantically related. So it's still not easy to automate, although I'm trying to get some people to work on this. So the hard part was how to evaluate this in a convincing, reproducible way. Because the papers about word clouds that come up with new algorithms for them were very vague about this. They say the goal of word clouds is a gist or a summary or to navigate or to see trends. Everyone has something different to say about what they do. And the studies that study them do things like identify the largest word or identify a given word, which is a word search task. It's not a find the gist task. Or if they say find the gist, the answer is to pick the biggest word. So that is not a fair evaluation. If you want to find the biggest word, just list a word really big. You don't need the other words. So it's not evaluating the words together. So the question is how to evaluate these deeply and consistently. Say they are for a gist. What's the answer? You don't know? Why not? It only took me nine months to come up with it. So this is where the persistence comes in. I really didn't want to write this up until I could prove that this idea was better. And I didn't work on it nine months straight without anything else. As a professor, you're very busy. You have a lot of stuff going on. And it was a side project. But it took that long. And I thought about studies from psychology and other sorts of things. I kept thinking about it as I did other stuff. But finally, the inspiration came from a game, the game of taboo. In the game of taboo, you, uh, somebody has a category and, and, and they say words, and actually I forget how it works exactly because I'm going to get it backwards. But what we did was a variation of taboo, not exactly the same. Given a set of words, identify the category. So we came up with sets of five words like this. What, what category does this bring up? Anyone? Yeah. We came up with sets of words like this that for a native English speaker would, with very high certainty, compel them to say one word. So that means if we show those five words like this, then the gist is this unshown word, restaurant. So if the word cloud is good or if the visualization is good, at showing the gist, the person can infer the missing word. So it's sort of reverse taboo. And this can be reused. Now, you don't just show five words, though. You show, you mix them up. So here we've got the color coding, and we have two sets of words. So you have to look through and see that there's two categories, two latent categories here. So cow and university or college, we could have two words for that. And then you can add and do five. So now the question becomes, can people find these under some time controls in a typical word cloud layout or in a better layout? And we compared. And not surprisingly, the organized layout where things are semantically related and grouped together and the colors correspond to the meaning on the far, you know, like on column A, did much better than the others at letting people pull out these categories and name them. And we were able to show with great statistical significance and confidence that that was the case. And furthermore, you can mix and match these groups and make new, new word clouds automatically if you want to test these things with lots of different configurations. So we can release these word lists and other people can do tests just like we did for variations of the tests. So sometimes coming up with the evaluation in our field is the hardest part, especially when usability is your goal. Coming up with a good evaluation is really hard. And that's what I tell my students now is actually we have to start with the evaluation. We want to show this is a good idea, and that's going to be hard to do. And we found that visually grouped layouts compared to ungrouped layouts are more effective in time-constrained category understanding tasks. Visual grouping can achieve by separating categories via white space or color or both. And for analytical tasks, layouts with white space tends to be preferred over spatially arranged grouping. So basically what we're showing is preferred over word clouds as well as being more effective. In the studies we did, people preferred these layouts. 
Now, the, the groups have to be semantically distinct, and that's still the part that's not automated. So until we can automate that, we're probably no one's going to use it. Since I'm low on time, I'm going to skip this last thing, right? I should wrap up, right, Greg? It's a little after one. Right? So I'm going to skip this last example because it takes a little bit of time. And this talk, I'm going to skip that. I inter so in summary, creativity is a process. You use several strategies together. Motivation drives it. Associative thinking followed by unfocusing. Look where others are not. Bring a fresh perspective. Impose constraints on the solution. Be patient and work at it. At least for me, I use combinations of these in my work, and it's what works for me. And finally, have a playful attitude. Games are a good starting point, but generally, see it playfully, not so seriously, and you will tend to be more creative, at least in my experience. And thanks so much for your attention. It was a wonderful talk, and I uh, really enjoyed uh, listening and learning about how you think. Uh, and uh, now we get to ask you some questions, if that's, if that's OK. Um, how are we doing with questions on Zoom? OK, then we'll take some from inside. Any questions here that we want to start with? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Hi. Thank you so much for giving your talk. It was incredible. Um, I had a question about your poetry part, um, where you had the two words, and then I would suggest a third word. So I was wondering about um, how much of the creativity you attributed to like the prompting the computer did. and like Because when I saw it, I thought, oh, that's such an in interesting idea to combine the two words and then have the human sort of fill in um, the creative connection between the two. And I was wondering how that might be different from just pulling two words at random um, and doing the same exercise. Yeah, that's that's a great point. And you know, if, if I give the full talk on this, I would explain all that. Uh, we did compare different ways of doing the combination, and we found that this motivated combination led to more creative uh, connections. Well, not too random, but we compared showing two concrete terms together versus this poetic term with the concrete term. Uh, we didn't compare to completely random. Uh, that would be a good study to do. But we wanted to use this. We wanted to find a way to have people use this sort of like Coffean notion of, of the combining into this sort of metaphor overlay. But it would be good to compare completely random as well and see what would happen in that case. We felt like you know people could already do that, and there are random word generator programs out there. So we didn't think we'd be adding to that if we did that. There's also a game like that, apples to apples, where I think you have to explain your the relationship between two terms or several terms. And uh, uh, But it made me wonder, throughout your talk, I was thinking about how much language shapes thought. We often think that thought shapes language, and we think about what we're about to say, and then we say it. But really, you keep showing evidence for how much our thinking occurs in inherited language structures. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts about that, if you think that's true uh, or not. Well, you know, also, as, as also I metaphors shape our expectations of the world, and, and really they come from elsewhere. So they're kind of like viruses that teach us how to think or something. Well, I, you know, as I showed in my intro slides, I, I'm very interested in language personally. It drives a lot of my thinking. That said, that's just my angle. And uh, we can talk about the Worfian hypothesis of does language drive thought or vice versa. The last I looked, it's all unsettled. It does seem to be a feedback loop. It's very complexly interrelated. And so you know, there's no definitive answer for that. I look a lot at the language choices. So in usability, say website design or app design, mobile app design, word choice matters. You have very limited screen real estate, very limited time for people to look at things. If you have long sentences, you know people aren't going to read them. In fact, I was just lecturing before this to my class. And a single word choice makes a huge difference. If you just say you have a menu, and if you use the word people versus 
you know, activities that can make all the difference between what's someone going to anticipate is under that menu. So in a lot of what I teach and what we do, you have to iterate on the choice of language to see if it serves the purpose that you want when you have very little, uh, where you can only have one or two words shown. Uh, and then we also talk about how you append other words. So it's, it's not that language fully drives thought, but in my world, because you are choosing what people see in the language, you have to put a lot of thought into what that's going to trigger in, into their next options or their next operations. That said, you know, I, I showed some image examples. Uh, I, I have an anecdote I love uh, from some of my colleagues that, that are more image focused, where it was a design uh, tool, a tool to give feedback to designers. And in this case, it was for visual designers like architects or interior designers. And the way the feedback was given in this, in this piece of work, and I'm afraid I forget the, the names of the authors, rather than having, they compare giving verbal feedback to just having people pick from a mood board what they, you know, there was a mood board and then there was the design and just the mood board to say what they thought of the design. And the artists could then, the architects could see if the mood board matched or didn't match what they expected. And when it didn't match, they realized that their design was problematic and they found that easier to take than negative words which, which bothered them. So giving the critique in the same medium was very helpful there and in the other medium was unhelpful. So I, I, I retain that example when I think about design. That's, that's, that's a great answer. Um, I, I would agree that images help us structure our thoughts as well, but so much comes from the outside as opposed to the inside. Any other questions from you all? It, you, second question, and one from, let's do one from Zoom, and then your question again. Hello, okay. Joyce Lee asks, hi, Professor Hurst, thanks for the great talk. Data, visualiza data visualizations like people, Georgia Lupe, are not often immediately decipherable on purpose. Can you discuss your thoughts on this type of tension between creativity and usability? I didn't catch the name that- uh, Georgia Lupi? Oh, like Georgia of the, the two uh, people that correspond. I'm not sure if I know the name of the- Yeah, I'm not part. sure either about who that is. Uh, but I guess the question is, tension between creativity and usability. With oh, creativity and usability. Oh. Sometimes artists want to create visualizations that intentionally resist usability. Ah, yes. So to get people to think a little harder about what it's all about. Right, right. So um, Rich Gold, who we were talking about earlier, who is a wonderful artist and, and designer at Xerox Park, used to talk about the difference between art artists and designers. And he would say, an artist does this, and a designer does this. And I think they're two different things. One is designing to express yourself and the other is to help others accomplish a goal. I just think that there are two different goals. Sometimes though, uh, a visualization, maybe the idea is to provoke or make people think. There's a famous one uh, about, um, I'm gonna forget the name of it right now, but it was showing in a very kind of oblique way, in a very kind of elegant way, the effects of, of uh, drone strikes uh, bombing and it showed data actually quite brilliantly but it was also just very effective uh, emotionally and and so when you can get that blend just right I mean that's that's ideal so I think that the two can work together really well and I'm afraid I'm forgetting the name of the design right now it's a very famous one by Stamen Design so yeah. uh, so legibility can be an entry point for deeper, more ambiguous feelings. I think, I think that's a good observation. Um, you're, you're next, yeah. Thank you so much. If someone else would like to speak, yeah, please go ahead. But I was very inspired by your talk. Um, I was wondering how you determine usability, and that's something you talked about a few times, and I was really wondering, like, in this world where all the design companies say, oh, we're human-centric, and you hear that term really thrown around a lot, how do you actually go about effectively determining what is successful des de 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 design and what's usable? How do you know that it's reached a good point or going in the right direction? 
Yeah, yeah, that's great. It's it's a big field now. Uh, when I started, it wasn't. You know, Xerox Park was doing it, and people didn't talk about it. So it, when it went mainstream, you know, with with the web, with the openness of interfaces that way, uh, that was a great thing. I mean, for a long time, there weren't very many software packages, and you had to like buy it and get it in a box and put it on your computer. So when the web happened, and you could see hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of designs, then uh, it moved the field forward. It's, it's a practice, and it has to do with uh, assessing with people to see uh, if certain outcomes are achieved when they make use of the design. And depending on what you're assessing, you need to go about doing it differently. That's why uh, it was so hard for me to assess uh, these word clouds because the way people had done it was, you know, they hadn't tried very hard, really. Uh, right now, we're trying to assess the design for helping people skim research papers, and we're having a heck of a time doing that. In fact, we still haven't come up with a good assessment, at least in a reasonable time frame. Sometimes you have to do it over a very long time frame, and you need to have that kind of time. And it's, it's called a longitudinal design, where you have people use something for months and, and then see if, how it's working for them. And often there's a learning effect for some tools, and so it changes from the beginning till, to many months later. But it's really a set of practices very pragmatic, uh, measuring outcomes from beginning to end, and n not you know performance as well as valence, as well as you know emotional attitudes. Uh, but you know getting that design right is is very tricky. But there's a lot of classes on it and courses on it, uh, and it takes practice. Any other questions? <laughs> so I'd like to follow up on that notion of gist. I think uh, one could. You suggested that you were able to develop a way of measuring GIST, and, and that is really interesting, and I find it really innovative. And my question is, if you come up with something like that, sometimes the ultimate outcome of this work is not clear to you as, a, as an inventor, because you see something has a purpose, but sometimes that purpose later on by the world or by people who adopt your tool gets turned into something else. And sometimes your inventor's purpose might even be more subtle and sophisticated than all the, all its ultimate use. And do you have any thoughts about how, how, how to take responsibility for your creations? Well, I, I uh, was gonna, there was a lot of things I was gonna include in here that I didn't, but one was that often the inventor isn't the right, isn't the best predictor of how it's going to be used. And I had an example of a uh, tree map, which is a visualization that some people invented and they was then improved by others in a lot of ways and shown how to be used. Uh, in terms of how, uh, if it's used in a way that's not um, moral, say, in the future, if, if that's what you're going for, um, I think there's some things where it's pretty clear from the start that they probably only have nefarious uses and others where it's probably pretty clear that they can use, be used multiple ways. And I think the ones that where from the start it's pretty clear that it's uh, socially or ethically questionable, one should try to avoid doing those. But the rest, uh, I think we see with kind of everything, they can be used for good or ill. Uh, Tufte used to talk about PowerPoint is evil. <laughs> yes, you can use PowerPoint badly or you can use it well. Uh, of course, he's being tongue in cheek uh, with that, uh, just saying that he didn't like it as a design tool. But uh, yeah, I think, you know, we could say, you know, solar pow power, we all think solar power is great. I'm sure somebody could come up with a nefarious use for solar power in the future, solar panels or whatever. So I think that uh, really it has to be you know, other forces that, that impose, uh, that stop people from doing things that are wrong. You know, you can use a PA system like we have here to to spread hate, you know, there's, there's just pretty much everything can be used in technology in multiple ways. So I think that uh, you, know, you can be an advocate for what is the right way to use the technology as far as you see it, but people are creative and, and will do things that you wouldn't have anticipated. That's the nature of the creative process. Are there any more questions? So maybe we, st we stop here and uh, let me thank you again for a very inspiring talk and for also reminding us that uh, thinking and playing are so deeply related and um, for sharing some of your life joy uh, in terms of inventing new things and always coming back to playing with ideas 
and uh, coming up with wonderful conclusions and insights. So thank you so much. Thank you. It was fun. Thank you.